belongs there. In the zone, midair, my body stretched, riding on to the football. I loved the feeling, those few seconds when nothing was touching, when I was free, when I was doing what I loved and the rest of the world disappeared. I'm a game winner. Touchdown. The cheering crowd. We put another notch in the belt. Show the league who would dominate. Just like last year. State champions. First time in school history. Take it twice in a row. Second time in state history any school had swept for two years. It skimmed my fingers and fell away. Like a dream you could barely grasp after waking there. But not there. I hit the field, thudding and skidding on the turf. The ball tumbling away uselessly. Dream over. Game over. Back to real life. Driving home, I replayed it in my head a million times. Our first loss of the year. Me picking myself up, feeling the bruises forming, the adrenaline leaving my veins. The crowd quiet. Coach with that slack-jawed expression. My dad on the 50-yard line. Four rows up in the stands, manning the video camera. His face wasn't disappointed, no. Not one bit disappointed. <clears throat> he was sitting in his recliner when I got home. Four empty beer bottles and a fifth half full sat on the table next to him. I shut the door. He hit the pause button on the remote, nodded towards the couch. Sound, Brett. I took a breath, walked across the carpet and sat. Of course. He was replaying the game. Of course. It was paused exactly at the spot where I missed that pass. The past three years of my life, since I'd made it onto the Hamilton team, at the start of the freshman year, he'd been paused on every mistake I ever made on the field. He took a swig of his beer. Perfect, Brett. Perfect pass. Perfect. I couldn't get to it. He grunted, jabbed the remote at the TV like he was poking a fire. He rewound the tape. No, no, watch. And he hit the play button. And we watched the down from beginning to end. See? What do you see? My shoulders ached. Me missing a pass. He looked at me. Never happy with anything but total perfection. And his eyes went back to the screen. Why, though? Why did you miss it? My knees were killing me. The only thing I wanted was to zone out, but no. He had to teach me. Show me everything I wasn't. Show me everything he'd never been. I'm tired. I got the train in the morning. Can we do this tomorrow? He nodded, checking the rest of his beer and getting up. Yes, we're going to do this tomorrow, but we're also going to do this tonight. And he pointed at the screen as he passed to get another beer. What do you see, Brett? I saw a long pass. I heard him pop the cap on a fresh one. He walked back in and sat down, tipping the bottle at me. Can't always be someone else's fault. You're late on the snap, look. And he hit rewind and played it again. See? That half a second meant you would have been there where you should have been. It wasn't a long pass. You should have been there. My father was an avalanche of ice spilling over me. But... Instead of stinging and burning, it was just numb. He was relentless, obsessed. It was one pass, Dad. He finished his beer. Less than three minutes from full to empty, and he shook his head. Exactly one pass. Losers lose, and you lost because you didn't pay attention. I grunted, glancing at his bo beer bottle still clutched in his hand. He didn't happen to notice the four I caught, or maybe that I went 97 yards, or maybe that my room is full of trophies. Don't start with that bullshit, Brett. I'm tired of your attitude. On top of that, I know you're failing math, which means no football. He shook his head and tried to take a swig of the bottle, which was empty. He looked at it, irritated, and tipped it at me. Yeah, coach called. You're failing. I don't know what your problem is, but we've got a scout from UCLA coming to look at you next week. I'm not going to let anything ruin that, including tonight. What if he'd been there? What if he'd seen it? You should give 
my dad a penny less than a million dollars, and he'd bitch about that penny. And I knew he really didn't want to know what my problem was, and if he knew, he'd flip. He would have seen me miss a long pass. He shook his head and his eyes bleary. You want to be a smartass? Fine. Grounded for the weekend. Forced manual labor. Go to bed. Dad. Hey, come on. So I should have caught the pass. I'll watch the tape tomorrow. I'll work. I'll work on the snap. He shook his head. Grounded. At least until you buck up. And he raised an eyebrow at me. Lose attitude, huh? This isn't Little League. You're not playing with a bunch of little pukes with no talent. You're a champion. Relentless. Never ended. There's a party tomorrow night. The whole team's going to be there, please. I said grounded, and he held out his hand. No phone either. Not until you bring that grate up. I bit my lip, tempted to stuff the phone down his throat. But I handed it over. He threw it on the table and went back to watching the screen. I watched him, watching me fail. And I knew why I was in trouble. Math had nothing to do with it. Chapter 2 Three years of waking up at five in the morning, seven days a week, rain or shine, vacation or not, has a tendency to create a habit. I didn't need an alarm anymore. Every day in my life began the same. And I look forward to it. Roll out of bed, throw on whatever gym clothes I had lying around, run five miles along the bluff overlooking the Palos Hills. Then I was back home, eat breakfast, head to the gym, hit the weights for an hour, shower, dress, go to class. After school, I'd hit the gym or the field, depending on the time of year, and train more. It was grueling. I loved it. I loved working my body. Because I could see a difference. I could run faster, lift more, go longer. The more I worked, the better I got. My dad and my coach, they couldn't take that away from me. And when I ran those miles and worked those weights, the hollow pit in my stomach that I got, and thinking about how much I hated football disappeared. Just like when I hit the field at the beginning of the game. How could I hate something so much and love it at the same time escape me? Insanity at its best. After a weekend doing forced manual labor to pay for the ultimate sin of not catching a ball, I caught up with Mike Jackson, otherwise known as my best friend and teammate. Sixth period was over and he stood with Jeff Lyons and Tilly Peterson, both linebackers, laughing, talking, joking their usual bullshit. I joined them, slapping five. School was out. We were free. Hundreds of students hustled through the indoor courtyard, streaming down the stairs, milling around. Talking before leaving for the day. Mike and I met in detention, of all places, back in sixth grade. He'd mouthed off to his teacher, and I'd been busted for flicking a carrot at Naomi Wilson during lunch. We discussed our punishments in whispers, each coming to the conclusion our crimes had been well worth the punishment. I'd scored a direct hit on Naomi's forehead, and Mike just plain like mouthing off to teachers. Since then, we've been glued at the hip. Sixth grade summer camp, trips to the mall hanging at the skate park, walking around downtown, looking for hot girls. When I tried out for the football team in seventh grade, Mike joined me. And even though he didn't know a touchdown from a field goal, he made it. Big for his age, he was pretty agile. He knew how to hit naturally. Yo, Stick, he said, holding his hand out. I slapped them five. They called me Stick because I had sticky fingers. Good at catching things, which meant everything at school. Sorry I missed the party. Dude, I tried to call you like five times. It was awesome. I shrugged. He knew the story without me having to tell it. The pass? He really grounded you because you missed the pass? I nodded. Jeff laughed and punched my arm. Hey, check it out. Show's about to start. What show? He leaned close and pointed across the way. See Donnie? Dorco over there? I looked. And a kid, freshman by the looks of him, sat on a bench near the foot of the stairs. Skinny, small, blonde hair. He sat with one knee crossed over the other, reading a comic book. Absently bit his fingernail, head down and intent on a magazine. Yeah, so? Tilly, his big face eager, gave me a devious look. Then pointed up. Four more guys from the team. One of them, Lance Killinger, our infamously egotistical quarterback. 
stood at the railing of the second floor, looking directly down on the kid. Tilly made eye contact with him, barely nodding. They laughed and gave a thumbs up. Tilly put two fingers to his lips and let out an ear-splitting whistle. Everybody in the place stopped. The whistle echoed off into nothing. Everybody stared at the huge linebacker. And at the sudden, quiet, kid looked up, his eyes going to Tilly. Then Tilly smiled, pointed a massive arm at all the kid. All eyes went from Tilly to the boy, just as the guys upstairs released what they were holding. I watched as four eggs fell, glinting white, that afternoon sun like a silent, graceful missile. If one thing's true, most athletes are above average when it comes to hand-eye coordination. All four eggs exploded on the kid's head and shoulders. The cracking noise echoed as the slimy yolks cascaded over him. Tilly slapped his hands together, pumping his fist and bellowing through the courtyard. Ladies and gentlemen, now that is direct hit. Fucking awesome. Laughter erupted, and I stood there as it continued. Some people, mostly girls, they voiced their disgust, but nobody did anything about it. Of course it didn't. This was school. Nobody ever did anything. I looked at the kid, expecting him to do what he didn't do. He didn't do anything. He sat there unmoving. Egg dripping from him. No expression on his face. His eyes on Tilly. Then he looked down to his comic book, slowly turned the page, and resumed reading. Jeff laughed. Oh, awesome! Tilly was so typical. It was disgusting. I shook my head, hating myself in an instant for being just another person who didn't do anything. Tilly was joker of the team, but after three years of it, the thin line between fun and just plain mean was blurring. I mean, what did he do to deserve that? Tilly crossed his eyes at me. He was born, dude. That's why. Don't be an idiot. Hey, Till, you're an asshole. He laughed, slapping my shoulder just hard enough to let me know who was running the show. Jesus, stick. Put up your angel wings away, huh? Stop being a bitch. I looked at him. Suddenly, I hated him. I never really had much respect for the guy, but now, looking at how much enjoyment he was getting out of what he'd done, I would have loved to see him go head-to-head -head with a speeding train. I faced him. Hey, I got a question for you, Till. Why you always do stuff to guys who can't possibly beat the living shit out of you? It took a few seconds for him to understand that I'd questioned the basic rule of what being a complete dick was all about. I nodded when he didn't answer. You know Darren Sandwick? He was in science with us last year. You know, the guy with five black belts in jiu-jitsu? Fights in a cage every month out at the casino? Yeah, him. The guy who could destroy you in less than a minute? I said, staring at him. He still didn't answer, and I went on. Why don't you pull that crap on him? Tilly smiled, but there wasn't a smile in his eyes. Our football team, just like any other team, had a pecking order, and I just pecked the wrong way. <laughs> it's a joke. Come on. Not really, Till. It's not. It just shows you're a pussy. And you're mean, I said. And turned around and walked away. As I did, I glanced at the kid and he stared at us. Completely neutral look on his face. He had no chin, big dark eyes, and pale skin. Then he slowly closed his comic book, put it neatly in his egg splatter backpack, got up, and walked out the doors like nothing had happened. I imagine him walking or taking the bus home, a public example of what happens when you're born to be slowly beaten into nothing more than a warm bag of humiliation. I knew what the kid's life was and what it had always been. One look at him and anybody would know he was the butt of every joke, the target of endless pranks. And I couldn't imagine how he could live with it every day, the eyes on you, the laughter, always expecting something to happen and knowing you were too weak to do anything about it. Part of me understood why guys like him came to school and put bloody holes in things with high-caliber weapons. I heard running feet from behind and turned. Mike came up to me. Hey, I said. He glanced back at the guys. Hey, what's up with you and Tilly? I pointed out the doors where the kid had gone. You're good with that? What, the kid? He said, shrugging. Lighten up. I wondered if Mike was changing into something I didn't know or if I was the one who was changing. So you are good with that. 
Hey, I'm not the bad guy here. I didn't have anything to do with it. He smiled then. Watching isn't a crime, bro. No, it's not. But I don't think it bothers you. And that bothers me. He smirked. Since when does anything bother you? You're like a little tin soldier doing exactly what he's told. Can't you ever just have some fun? I could have fun. But I wanted to walk up to that kid. Make him somehow feel better. But I didn't. Couldn't. I never did. I just shut my mouth. Did what was expected. Mike was right. I was the best high school wide receiver the state of Washington had ever seen. And I needed to protect that. That's not fun to me. Well, you're putting it all on me, and that's not cool. I thought of my dad and of Coach Williams, of math. I know you wouldn't do that shit, but when is it all enough? When is it too much? And he studied me, a question in his eyes. What are you talking about? Everything. This whole school, the team. Sometimes it seems like it's just all fake. Like a pretend world, like we're something better than all the dregs. Isn't that what Coach tells us? That we're better than everybody else? Weekend that bad? Mike knew about my dad, the real dad. Not the greatest, most cool sports dad to everybody in the outside world. Let's just say the career's light stock isn't going down. Chapter 3 Next day, Coach Williams' massive frame darkened the doorway from his office into the gym. His voice bellowed over the screeching tennis shoes and bouncing balls. Patterson, in my office, now. I looked up mid-shot, the ball frozen in my hands, and I watched him disappear into his office, slamming the door shut. Mike pivoted inside, stole the ball, and landed a crazy weird hook shot. Free period was almost over, and I hadn't even broke a sweat, not until I heard those words. Mike laughed. <laughs> Come on, sticks. Stay on the ball, man. But most seniors had a free period, and instead of going to study hall or the library, I shot hoops to get my mind off things. Crap. Mike dribbled the ball around me and landed a perfect layup. Go, man. Then I have you cleaning his toilet with your tongue if you don't. I walked across the gym knowing Mike was right. I reached the door and knocked. Get in here. I opened the door. Coach Williams sat beside his desk, hands clasped over his fat belly. Nike visor perched high on his forehead. He'd played three years for the Dolphins back during the Stone Age. Coach like an ex-NFL player on crack and didn't take crap from anybody. He lived and breathed football and would have bet a thousand dollars his DNA code was strung together with a pigskin. Hey, coach. He pointed to the chair. The chair could either be a good place or an incredibly bad place. I had a feeling today it would be the latter. I sat looking at him. He picked up a piece of paper, crumpled it, threw it at my chest. I flinched as it bounced to the floor in silence. Coach Williams, besides being the best yeller I'd ever known, could intimidate a person even more with the opposite. Utter, stone-cold, piss-your-pants-because-you-know-something-really-very-bad is going to happen silence. I looked at him, and his black eyes swallowed me whole. I can bring my grade up, Coach. I can. His answer was the muscles in his jaw pulsing as he clenched his teeth. Resigned, I looked down. Whatever. His hand slammed on his desk that made me jump as high as the pen holder, stapler, coffee mug, and team picture the Miami Dolphins did. His voice came low and sharp. Tell me the first rule of football at the school, Brett. And by the way, if you ever say whatever to me again, I'll run you till you puke your lungs out. The coach had no tolerance for two things. One was weakness. The other was anybody daring to mouth off to him. I'd seen him cut a first-string running back for calling him an asshat. First string. Off the team. Done. Coach pointed to the sheet of grades crumpled on the floor. We're not talking calculus or physics or honors, Patterson. We're talking math. Plain and simple math. Count on your fingers and get an answer math. So tell me the first rule of football at this school. Great, sir. He continued. You know what happens when you fail math at this school? Yes, sir. He crossed his arms over his chest. Then why don't you tell me, Mr. Brilliance? Tell me what happens. It means I don't play football. He clenched his teeth. If it were that simple, my life would be a piece of freaking cake, Patterson. I know you can catch a ball, but why don't you put whatever brain you have to use and tell me what it really means? And I shrugged. He shook his big head and took his visor off and threw it on the desk. You fail math, you don't play. That's the easy part. 
The bigger part is you let down your team. You let down your music school. You let down your dad. You let down the game itself. You got a chance at a full ride scholarship this weekend with the scout from UCLA visiting. And we got a chance at another state championship at the end of the season. He paused, staring at me. You going to blow in your future because you can't count on your fingers? I'm not stupid. Math is just hard for me. I mean, I try. He blinked, intense and unrelenting. Your dad made of money? You got, like, a money tree growing on your backyard? I've known him for 25 years, and I've never seen one in your yard. Am I missing something here? I met his eyes. I said I'm not stupid. He jabbed a finger at me. The same finger he jabbed at me since I was a freshman. You don't tell me what you think you are, aren't, Patterson. You're exactly what I say you are, and nothing else. People over a hundred thousand dollars to get an education at UCLA, and they want to give it to you for free. You can't pass a caveman math. That, he said, hitting his desk again, is stupid. I got to talk to my teacher. He said I could. The coach slammed his hand down loudly for the third time. You know what, Patterson? I don't care what you have to say. I don't care what your teacher has to say. As long as you're on my field, you don't fail. You got that? And it also means you play by my rules and my rules only. We've worked the snap into eternity and you were late on it. So make your decision right here, right now. Make it. You'll pull your head out of your ass and get your game on or you walk. I looked at him. He looked at me. I knew in an instant he could see right into my soul. He could see the truth, and I'd studied his face. You're afraid, aren't you, Coach? You're afraid that I'm not afraid of you anymore, huh? His face hardened. Don't go down that road, Brett. You don't want to see where it ends. Right then I knew what I was to him. I was a pair of hands and a ticket to his glory. That's all that mattered to anybody. Winning. And winning at all costs. This was insane. My dad, the team, Mike... That football field under the lights flashed through my mind. But it was now. It was here. I was tired of being afraid, and for some reason, the kid with the egg splattered all over him looked up at me and grinned through it all. Maybe I do want to see where it ends up. He picked up the phone, threatening me. You want this? You want me to drag your father in here so we can hash it out? See what he says? Because right now, you're one smart-ass word away from sitting a bench for a game. My heart slowed. And clarity came over me. It was so simple. I'd spent so much time sweating this. But it was really that simple. You won't bench me. His eyes widened for the slightest moment before his bluster came back. I saved him a response. You can't win state without me. He smiled. Ugly smear crossing his face. You think I haven't been leveraged before, son? I shrugged, meeting his eyes. You can't win without me. He took a moment, the little mice in his head turning his wheels. This game isn't about one person, Brett. It's about working as a team. It's about trust and dedication and hard work. It's about accomplishing a goal. I almost laughed. Football is about power and control, fear and intimidation. But more than anything, it was about winning. And Coach Williams had proved it for years. I'd seen him play injured guys... I'd heard him tell players to target opponents. He'd do anything to win, and he'd use anybody in order to do so. I stood. What do you think you're doing? I'm walking down that road. And then I left. Chapter 4 Sixth period dragged on, and I got the call to go to the office after class. The wheels began to spin, and I knew what I was in for. I looked at the kid sitting across from me in the office. My stomach crawled. Donnie Dorco, egg splatter man. The kid I didn't want to think about because he reminded me of what I hadn't done. I shifted uncomfortably as I waited for my counselor. I knew I could thank Coach Williams for being called in. Hey. He said nothing, just sat there, hunched over a bit, his elbow on his knee, his palm under his chin. He stared at the floor. I thought of what Mike said. He hadn't had anything to do with it. And I hadn't either. Just happened to be there when it happened. Not a crime. I took a breath. 
Somehow that was a lame excuse. I did feel like I was a part of it, and I knew why. I didn't uh, have anything to do with yesterday, man. He bit his lip and studied the floor. He looked up at me without straightening his hunched shoulders. His eyes were big and brown and his skin pale. Biologically impossible. I frowned. Huh? His voice was lower than I thought it would be and tinged with sarcasm. He reminded me of a frog. He went on. Unless you can suddenly not exist for a period of time, all matter that existed yesterday had something to do with yesterday. Rocks, trees, dirt, people, all matter. I sat back, slouching my shoulders. Great. Weird on the outside, weirder on the inside. Whatever. He kept those eyes on me, but said nothing. I clenched my teeth, frustrated. I was just saying I didn't have anything to do with yesterday, with the egg thing. He turned his head down and stared at the floor again, methodically drumming his fingers against his lips. I sat waiting, and he said nothing. I tried again. It was uncool. When he finally spoke, his voice was deadpan, completely unemotional and awkward. He blinked. Is this some kind of sad, pathetic way to apologize while admitting nothing, while at the same time making me think you're saying sorry for something you apparently had nothing to do with? He looked at me. Or are you gay, and this is your way of hitting on me? No, no, Jesus, I, I was just saying I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what was happening. He nodded, resumed his hunched over position. It's fine to be gay. But I'm not a homosexual. Sorry. I looked at him, and I could tell for some odd reason that he wasn't being sarcastic. I'm not gay, and I am sorry. I, I should have stopped it. Stop what? The hands of time? Sun from rising? Idiots from being idiots? I propped my head back against the chair, closing my eyes. So, what's your name? Preston Underwood. Why are you here? I'm an undercover agent. There's a drug ring here at the school, giving the principal a report. I blinked and then looked at him. I hear drug rings are a real problem here. Mexican cartel? He looked across the office at the receptionist. No. They use idiot football players as mules to traffic their product. I laughed. Most people don't recognize a sophisticated sense of humor like mine. Why are you here? Maybe because I made a decision. First time for everything. Funny, funny. I wasn't joking. I smiled. You know you're weird, right? Yes, he said. And I know you're an ignorant asshole. Weird versus ignorant asshole? Weird always wins. I said I was sorry. He shrugged and sat up. His fingers were longer and slender, and he slowly tapped his knee with his middle finger. And I accept your apology. But that does not make you an ignorant asshole. I felt better for some reason. At least he was honest. Fair enough. So why are you really here? My counselor thinks she needs to counsel me. About what? Your sophisticated sense of humor? No. She needs to think that she's doing her job, so I come twice a week. I don't like disappointing people because I have an abnormal trait called empathy. Why'd you make a decision? I didn't know where to start with this kid, so I didn't. I slouched in my chair. I don't know. Just tired of everything. Coach was busting my balls because I'm failing math, which means I can't play ball, which means it's a big pity party for him and my dad. Why are you failing math? I frowned, wondering why he was interested in the least important thing about this whole deal. Because I suck at it, I said. I didn't want to talk about it because all the things I could do well, math truly wasn't one of them. It wasn't that I was slacking. The numbers just didn't fit my head right. So are the drug smugglers, if they are uh, not Mexican cartel? I was joking. Yeah, I know. It was a way to change the subject. His eyes went to the clock. Nine minutes, 37 seconds. What? He looked at the clock again. How long have I been sitting here? I'll miss the bus. Where do you live? Downtown. The only people I knew who lived downtown were homeless, crazy, or drug addicts. Huh? He frowned. Huh, what? Where downtown? The river's edge. Where is it? He stared at me for a moment. You are stupid, aren't you? What? Never mind. It's on the river between Maple and Monroe. 
I wonder what this kid was all about. I'm seeing my counselor too. He's going to try to convince me to undecision my decision, even though I'm not really sure what I decided. If you're done when I am, I'll give you a lift home. He looked at me and there was a shadow of caution in his eyes. No thanks. Mr. Reeves came out of his office, saw me, and motioned. And I stood. See you around, I said, and then went inside. Chapter 5 I didn't know Mr. Reeves that well. He'd taken care of a few class changes for me overall. He sort of came off as the kind of guy who didn't have much to say about anything. One of those ghosts in the hall who made an occasional appearance. You wanted to see me? Yeah, Coach Williams called me after your meeting today. He's concerned. I sat down. I know. He studied my face. He relayed to me that he is worried about your attitude. No, he's not. He's not? He could give a shit about my attitude. He looked down at his desk, and I gave it a 75% chance that the next words out of his mouth would be for me to watch my language, no matter how rotten to the core of an apple. Keeping the outside bright and shiny was the most important thing. But he took a breath, his eyes returning to me. What was he worried about? My respect scale rose. Maybe he was cool. I hitched my head toward his door. That glass case out in the office? The trophy case? It's the only reason I'm sitting in here. He sat back. Coach Williams told me you were failing math. That, to me, is a concern. I laughed. I suppose if me failing math were a concern, my math teacher would have called you. But he didn't. Coach did. Coach Williams also told me you've become... rebellious. I looked around the room, searching for the unusual signs. They were there. Poster of the basketball team. School colors on the walls. An old picture of him playing college football. Two framed newspaper articles from last year highlighting a win of some sort. I smiled. You play ball? Satisfaction spread across his face. Actually, I was a receiver for the Oregon Ducks back in the day. Second string. But it was the experience of a lifetime. I'll bet... I said. So you're here to convince me to do what I need to do to put another trophy in your sacred little case, too. The three-minute friendship we had disappeared, and his face hardened. I think you make assumptions, Mr. Pattison. Coach Williams, but I stood. Coach Williams is a douchebag, and I'm done talking. And then I moved to the door. Yes, he is. And I turned back to him. What? He nodded. Yes, he's a douchebag. Will you sit down, please, Brett? I'm not your enemy here. I gawked. You do know that I could tell him you said that, right? Hey, Coach Williams is well aware of how I feel about him. Yes, I played sports, but no, I don't care about that trophy case. Then why am I here? He gestured to the chair. Why don't you sit down and tell me? Chapter 6 I closed the door behind me. Preston was nowhere to be seen, and I stood there for a moment, tempted to wait, when his counselor's door opened and Preston walked out. He looked at me. What are you doing standing there? I just got out. He hitched his backpack higher on his shoulder and walked past me. And all the world's problems solved in 20 minutes, he said. And I watched him go. This kid who was silent but had so much to say, then followed him out. He exited the building and walked to the edge of a parking lot where he stopped and stared at his watch. I came up behind him. Sure to want to lift? He turned. Wow, I've got a fan club. I got a car is all. You said that you'd miss the bus. He looked at me, with those big, wide-set eyes and small nose and chin. He reminded me of a cartoon character. Do you know why most people give to charities? I felt the warmth of the afternoon sun on my cheek. Mr. Reeves and I had had an interesting talk, and even though I still didn't know what decision I should make, I knew what decision I was making. I don't know. Help people? People help other people because it makes them feel better about being selfish. There are tons of people who are good. He smiled for the first time I'd met him. I wasn't talking about tons of people. I was talking about you, he said, and then walked away. I'd never been a glutton for punishment, but I couldn't get the image of him sitting calmly with an egg all over him out of my mind. I watched him shuffle off, walking like a gangly duck, and went to my car. Got in, turned on the ignition, put it in gear, and drive. As I drove out of the parking lot, I couldn't help myself. I pulled up alongside him and rolled the passenger window down. Okay, I'm selfish, and I do feel guilty, but I had no idea it was going to happen. Will you get in the car now? He kept walking. 
Why should I want to make you feel better? Why would I even want to know you? I stopped the car, thinking. Then I pulled forward and leaned over. You shouldn't. But maybe I want to know you. And that stopped him. And he faced me. You want to know me. I rolled my eyes. No, I'm not gay. And yes, I do. Now get in. And he did. Where's your place? He buckled up. I'll show you. Just head to Monroe Street and go over the bridge. I pulled away from the curb. So how'd the council go? He looked at the middle council where the crunched up McDonald's wrapper lay. Next to it was an empty Red Bull can. There were various bags, wrappers strewn about the floor. The car wasn't the cleanest. And the back seat was full of months old crap too. I picked up the wrapper and held it staring at the window. It went fine. I think she's doing well with it. She, with what? The grieving process. She's following it precisely. Straight from the book. And I drove. Did she lose somebody? No, I did. State wants to make sure I'm coping correctly, so I check in with her. The school's so very concerned about my emotional well-being. Who'd you lose? He picked up the empty Red Bull can and began slowly crunching the wrapper inside. My dad, six months ago. See? We're supposed to go through stages of grief. She thinks we're at stage four, which is depression and loneliness. I glanced at him, and he picked up an old straw and was idly folding it into the can. She thinks? I said. He nodded. Yeah, a couple weeks ago she moved out of anger and bitterness stage. She? I'm, I'm confused. You're not grieving about losing your dad? Of course I am, just not the way she needs me to. Why don't you tell her that? He inched his hand toward a gum wrapper, hesitated, and picked it up. Rolled it into a ball. Into the can it went. Why should I tell her? I'll need her help. And I'll feel like arguing about where I'm in her process. Well then, tell her you don't need counseling. It's just a check-in. Like mini counseling. I have a regular counselor. He thinks the same thing, though. I think they talk. Totally confused, Preston. You're seeing a counselor you don't need. You go to a school counselor to help her with your grieving process. It doesn't bother you at all? Nope. Why? He stuffed the used napkin in the can, twisting and turning it. Because it gets me what I want. I glanced at him. He was systematically cleaning my car. What? A neurotic need to clean my car? He set down the can, self-conscious. I have a compulsion to keep things in order. No kidding, I never would have guessed. So what is it you want? I looked out the window. How'd your counseling session go with Mr. Reeves? It wasn't a counseling session, he just wanted to talk. Preston shrugged. Going to see a counselor to talk is called a counseling session. It's the definition of it. I sighed. We're fine, except that when I get home, all hell's going to break loose. Why? I turned left on Monroe. Because I know Coach Williams called my dad and the shit's going to hit the fan. I have no idea what you're saying. I took a left on Madison Avenue. Thinking of quitting football. Why would you care if your dad was mad about that? I rolled my eyes. You're kidding, right? It's just like if you quit school. Wouldn't your mom be mad? No. But if she were, that's her issue. I gaped. She wouldn't be? She's not the one going to school. I took a breath, again not knowing where to go with that statement. So what you're saying is, is that my dad, who has lived through me for the last three years because he loves football more than life, shouldn't be upset if I quit. And he shouldn't be pissed that I'd most likely be giving up a scholarship that could eventually get me into the NFL? I'm not saying he shouldn't. He could be if he wanted to, I suppose. What does that have to do with you playing your game or not? Oh, I I guess my world's different than yours. He pointed to a parking lot for me to turn into. Only because you want it that way. I pulled into the lot. Nothing is the way I want. What if you told your dad that it's none of his business? What if he ignored everything he said? What would he do? I smirked. You don't know my dad. Would it make you feel bad? Bad? Yeah, like bad, like a bad person. I don't know, Preston. You lost me. How is it his business? I stared out the window. He'd make it his business. He studied my face with those big eyes and it made me uncomfortable. How? He 
he said. He just would. He opened the door. Thanks for the ride. I glanced around the empty parking lot. Clinker Dagger, a fancy restaurant, stood off to the left. You live in a parking lot? No, he pointed. There. I gazed upward, and what looked like a 15 or 20 story office building stood looming over the river. I always thought those were office buildings. No apartments. Huge windows for apartments. He grabbed his backpack and then quietly slipped the red bull can into his side pocket. They call it luxury condominium living. Wow, what floor do you live on? He got out and shut the door. The top one. Chapter 7. I sat in a car with my head swimming. I didn't want to go in and I wish my dad was out, but since he worked from home, he was always there. I thought about Preston and what he'd said, or not said, but asked. It was a strange thing. He never really said anything, and he asked everything. From being distracted by rappers in my car to not understanding why anybody would be upset that I quit football, he confused me. What if I did tell my dad it wasn't his business? What would he do? I turned the car off and hopped out, walked up the driveway. He was sitting at the kitchen table reading the newspaper and drinking a beer. This wasn't a day after four o'clock when he didn't have a bottle in his hand, and our house wasn't big enough to hide in or for me to go to my room without him knowing I was there, so I did what I knew I should. Hi. He looked up. Yeah, Coach Williams called. I leaned against the kitchen entry. Yeah? He set the paper down and took off his glasses. He was a big man, but not huge. I got my height from him, and at 6'3", he was an inch taller than me. He didn't have the build of a football player, but back in his day, he was. A receiver, he was just like me. He'd been good. Great, from what I'd heard. Got a full ride to Washington State University, but then blew his knee out in his first season. End of story. Now he was a business consultant, and he looked at me. I spoke to your math teacher. Not much for football players, but you'll be fine to play if you get extra credit done, he said, and then squinted at me. And by the way... You're grounded for disobeying an order. Don told me what you did in his office. Don was Don Williams or Coach Williams, and I rolled my eyes. Lucky me that they would be bromance together. Dad, he was totally out of line. I already talked to my teacher. I talked to Mr. Reeves. I did everything I was supposed to. There was no problem with anything. The guy just gets off using his power to crap on people. He put his glasses back on and picked up the paper, talking to it instead. We five games to take in the state championship, and you hold the key. Roger Sylvia, the scout from UCLA, is flying up for Friday's game, and you know why. He wants to meet, and I arranged to get together here on Saturday. I'm pretty sure he's coming with an offer. I stood in the doorway, staring at him while he ignored me. Sometimes I think he literally didn't hear a fucking word I said. And what if you ignored everything he said? What would he do? Preston's words came to me, and as I watched Dad, I didn't know what to do. As far as he was concerned, I didn't get to have an opinion or on what I wanted to do. I'd spent the day listening to one man hammering it into me, and now I was listening to another man treat me like I was a chess piece in this game of life. Everything rolled around in my head like a spinning bingo basket. I didn't do anything wrong, Dad. He took a swig of beer. Keep your eye on the goal, Brett. Anger boiled through me. What goal is that? My goal or your goal? He stopped mid-swig and then laughed. You can keep this up and you'll be grounded for the rest of the year. Be a smart ass somewhere else, huh? There are much more important things going on than how you feel about being put in your place. Quit whining and be a man. I was tempted to grab that beer and shove it down his throat, but I didn't. I turned around and went to my room. The visible things don't talk, so I didn't. Chapter 8 Football players wore their jerseys to school on game days, just like the cheerleaders wore their uniforms. Banners strung across the hallway supported and celebrated the team. An electric air filled the school with an underlying hum of excitement. The Saxons would be kicking ass and taking names. In the first five games of the season, we'd outscored our opponents by a total of 53 points. I caught 21 receptions for over 400 yards and had scored six touchdowns. My high school career included more completions and touchdowns than any other player in the history of the school, and I was well on the way to holding a state record for yardage. We'd taken state last year, and if we had take, took it this year, the consecutive wins would be the first in the history of Hamilton High School. I was a star. 
Lance Killinger, our quarterback, caught up to me in the hall after second period. Killinger and I didn't like each other, and it was well known that we didn't. It all started when he was born, came out of the hatch looking down on the world. And for however much he thought this crap didn't stink, it did. But he could throw and I could catch, and no matter how much of an arrogant ass clown he was, that's all that mattered to anybody. He was the kind of guy I'd be happy to never know, but we flowed together on the field like twins. He bumped my shoulder looking at my t-shirt. Where's the jersey, stick? You forget it? I had four minutes to get to class. Nope. You slacking? Skipping weights in the morning? No showing at practice yesterday? What's your deal? Been busy is all. You gotta represent, man. We're the kings of this school. I kept walking. Kings, huh? Is that right? It's up your ass, he said. Big guy's nervous about tonight. Just heading to class, Lance. Nothing special. Yeah, sure. Heard a UCL scout us to be here. Wow well, for you. Even though I can nail a dime at 40 yards, and the only reason you're good is that I hit your chest every time. And I faced him. You know, you know what I've never told you. He met my stare, and the challenge was right there. What is that, stick? You want to tell me something? I thought of everything I wanted to say but hadn't. What I wanted more than anything was my fist punching his face inside out. I wanted to tell you you're an awesome quarterback, and I know you're going to kill it tonight. He paused, question in his eye. Yeah, sure. You know what? West Valley equals big time fail. They suck. You got it, I said, taking a quick left into my class. Six period let out and I hustled in my car, and as I neared, I saw Preston standing next to it. He was staring at something at his feet. I took my keys out of my pocket. Hey, here to finish cleaning my car out? He looked up. Hi. What's up? Nothing. You standing around people's cars? He looked at me unsure, his eyes wavering, like he was nervous, but not. I was wondering why you're failing math. You didn't answer me yesterday. I almost laughed. Math, okay. My life was turned upside down, and there was a huge game tonight, and he was wondering about math. Because I suck at it, I told you that. He looked at me. I suck at football, but at least I know why. Why then? Because I'm five feet six inches tall. I weigh 117 pounds, and I have a tendency to fall down when I run. I stared at him, wondering where he'd come from and why. Well, I just suck at it. The numbers get all jumbled in my head. I could probably help you if you want me to. Why? I thought you didn't want to know me. Because I'm brilliant. I laughed. He cast his eyes down. Cool. Anyway, good luck with the game. Bye, he said, turning and shuffling away. Jesus, Preston. I wasn't laughing at you, I called to him. But he kept walking. I was laughing because you say shit that's just so out there, man. Stop. Stop. Come on. He did stop. Then he turned and faced me, his hands stuffed in his pockets and his shoulders slouched. I pointed to the passenger door of the car. Get in. I need my car cleaned. His eyes brightened. Really? I opened the door. As long as you can stay in the garbage, yeah, really. And as we pulled out of the parking lot, I checked my mirrors and then drove down 37th Avenue. So where are you from? A womb. Oh, okay. Where are you from? As in, where did you come from before you started at Hamilton this year? Chicago. We moved here after my dad died. How'd he die? He was murdered for $17. I'm sorry. Preston drummed his fingers on his knee methodically. He didn't do anything. I know. I just am, though. Did he catch the guy? And he shook his head. So you'll tutor me? Yes. And I smiled. Cool, thanks. He looked at me, totally serious. I don't want to be your boyfriend. It's not that way. Damn, I said. He fidgeted, eye popping a can. I could almost feel his need to clean, and I laughed. Go ahead, OCD boy. Have at it. He picked up the can. Being that you're alive today, your dad didn't kill you Tuesday night. I don't know what's worse, being completely ignored or being stomped on. Preston frowned as he stuffed the can in a fast food bag. Why is being ignored bad? I turned, heading downtown. Because I'm not me to him, or anybody. I'm what other people can get for themselves. Just like you said. Have you ever just had somebody completely ignore you? 
considering I still have egg on my backpack and the burn of being ostracized by my cooler peers is still hot in my belly, I would appreciate being ignored more often. I realized then, even if I had an idea of how much he was bullied, I would never truly know what it was like, and I felt a stab of guilt. That won't happen again if I'm around. And he reached into my console, scooping up a handful of change. My gay stalker's going to protect me now. Yay, I'm saved. I'm just saying, you know, it was a crappy thing to do, and I guess I'm seeing things differently now. He began separating the pennies from the rest of the change. I don't need anything from you, Brett. I can take care of myself just fine. I shook my head. Yeah, like having guys like Tilly make you into a fool in front of everybody. He turned those big eyes to me. Is that what he did? Made a fool out of me? Well, you got egg all over you. He looked down and stacked the pennies. I suppose the definition of fool depends on what side of the line you're on. He was right. Tilly is a fool. Preston stacked nickels. It doesn't matter what he is. It matters what I am. Time does it start. Time does what start? Your game. Three hours. Game time's in seven. He continued organizing my change, so I took the long way. I figured if we took a drive in the country, he'd have my car spotless in no time. But I was just happy to have a drive-in made. And ten minutes later, I pulled into the parking lot. So about this tutoring thing, yeah? I put the car in park. Is Sunday work? He nodded. I'll have to check my schedule, but I think I'm free from around 5 in the morning until 11 or so at night. He had a paper bag nearly full of trash, and the passenger side of the car was cleaner than it had ever been. Cool. How about I meet you here around 1? And he opened the door. Sure. And good luck with your game tonight. At 6 o'clock, my cell rang, and I ignored it. Two minutes later, it rang again. I picked it up, turned the ringer to silence, and put it back down sat in my car, sipping on a soda, looking out over the northwest part of the city. I've been draining the tank for hours driving around, and I finally pulled over, hopping out and taking a leak over the bluff. Dusk settled over the skyline and the sun below the horizon. I sat as the pink glow of the sunset faded to nothing. I glanced at my phone. Seven missed calls, and I knew each one was another marker on my headstone. But I couldn't answer. I just, I wouldn't answer. I thought about my dad. It all started with playing catch in the yard. Then my first team. I remember not being able to sleep the night before games. I was so excited. And I remember knowing deep down and almost like it was natural that I was good. Nobody had to tell me. I knew. And it felt good to know I was good at something. And then it began changing. All the praise from my coaches and other parents built up. And my dad thrived on it. I did too. I mean, I loved the attention, I loved the game, but there were expectations. By the time 8th grade started, high school coaches from around the city were contacting my dad, offering ways to slide around the districting rules to get me on their teams. Once my dad saw a future in me, things changed drastically. When I was a freshman, our post-game celebrations of getting ice cream or pizza turned into reviewing tapes, going over the playbook, talking strategy. Reviewing tapes then turned into incessant replays, and soon enough, I dreaded it. Good plays and great catches were skipped over, and my dad focused on every minuscule mistake I made. By 10th grade, training schedules and food restrictions were posted on the fridge. Ice cream and pizza were a thing of the past, and playing catch in the yard was history. Weekly barbecues in our backyard with Coach Williams turned into two-hour sessions in the living room where my dad and he talked about me as if I wasn't there. All those years of pushing, all those years of my dad telling me what I wanted and what I needed, all the years of punishments, all the times he'd gotten drunk, knocked me around because I wasn't good enough. Football was everything in his life. And fortunately for him, he had a son that could live his dream. But it wasn't my dream anymore. I felt like he'd snuffed it out along the way. From up on the bluff, I could see Joe Alby Stadium in the distance. At 6.30, the stadium lights blinked on. Half an hour till kickoff. I closed my eyes and I could hear and smell and see everything. The locker room, the echoing voices, the excitement, muffled sound of an announcer's voice welcoming the crowd. 
Coach Williams could come in and give his talk, not really a talk so much as a sermon from the pulpit of the gridiron. He'd tell us 100% wasn't enough. He'd tell us second place is loser's place. And this field, his field, was no place for pussies. He'd wind it up, his chest heaving, his face turning red, his voice a growl as he told us nobody, nobody could stop us, that we were champions. It was the one thing Coach was awesome at, pumping us up, getting us ready to smash. Our opponents will not just lose, they will have their souls ripped from them. They'll feel what it's like to be crushed under the boot of the Saxons, and we'd make it happen. We're the rulers of this league, and there's nothing that'll stop us. Each and every one of us, he'd say, would show the world what it meant to be the best. I opened my eyes and looked at those shining lights, making an oval around the stadium, and I laughed. No, coach, we wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'd sit in my car and wait for the end of the world because I was done with people telling me what I should do for reasons I didn't care about. I was done having people ruin the thing I loved the most. At 7 o'clock, I flipped the radio on, tuning in to the game, and for the next four quarters, I listened to the Saxons get their asses whipped. Chapter 9 I shut the car off in front of the house and picked up my phone. 17 missed calls and 10 unread texts. Five from my dad, one from my coach, and the rest from the team. I saw the curtains moving, and the next moment the front door opened and my dad stepped out, his frame outlined by the light from the living room. He stood there and his arms crossed over his chest. My shoulders tightened and I took the keys from the ignition and got out. As I reached him, he didn't move. He just stared at me in the darkness. You do know what you've just done, right? He said. I took a breath. I made my decision. He uncrossed his arms, running his hand through his hair. No, you didn't. You just screwed yourself, Brett. That's what you did. I screwed myself, or did I screw you? That's enough. What's enough? Does it matter what I think? His slurred words. Coach and I had a meeting after the game. Nobody knows what's going on. He told the scout you came down from food poisoning and couldn't play. Sylvia still wants to meet tomorrow. Ten in the morning here. I'm done playing. He clasped the sides of his head with his hands, looking up. And I don't get or want to get up every fucking day and be a consultant, Brett. We do what we have to do. And you have to do this. You're better than I am. God gave you something. Do you understand that? No, I don't. He grabbed my shoulders, bringing my face close to his. Do you understand that? But the only thing I saw reflected in his eyes was himself, his drunk self. But I didn't feel like getting thrown against a wall or yanked down the hall to my room. Sure, Dad. Okay, I understand. Chapter 10 Dad peeked his head inside my door. Sunlight streamed through the blinds. Come on, Brett. He's here. I turned my TV off and threw the remote on the bed. It was the first time I'd skipped my morning run in three years, and I felt like shit about it. Like something was missing. As I stood, I glanced at myself in the mirror, wondering for the thousandth time if I really did want to quit. I walked down the hall and into the living room. Mr. Sylvia was sitting forward in the recliner, his forearms across his knees. He's younger than I was expecting, in his early thirties. He wore a UCLA Bruins polo shirt, had dark, perfectly trimmed hair, and smiled. My dad sat across from the coffee table from him. Mr. Sylvia stood extending his hand. Hey, Brett, it's nice to meet you. I shook his hand. Nice to meet you too, sir. He nodded and then sat down. You feeling better? Your coach let me know you had food poisoning. And I sat down. Yeah, I suppose he did. Sylvia faltered and his face breaking from his smile for just the slightest second. Hey, yeah, it happens to the best of us, huh? Doesn't matter, though. I've seen all your tapes, and honestly, your numbers stand alone. Fantastic player, but I've seen in my entire career. For all I sucked at math, numbers swam through my head. My records, how many trophies I had, how many touchdowns I'd scored, how much it would cost to go to a school like UCLA, all the things that mattered in life. Thanks. He smiled again. Great. Well, I'm not going to waste your time or mine, he leaned forward. I know you're going to have other schools after you, but... Would you like to be a Bruin? I could almost feel the excitement emanating from my father. 
I could see Mr. Sylvia sitting there acting like he was doing me the biggest favor in my life, and I blinked, focusing on his face. I made the biggest, boldest statement of my life last night by not playing, and everybody was acting like nothing had happened. No, sir, I wouldn't. The silence of something dying filled the room. Mr. Sylvia's lips parted, but he didn't speak to me. He looked at my dad. Sir, would you mind telling me what's going on? Has Brett accepted an offer from another school? I swear to God, I heard my dad's heart constricting. He had to make himself breathe, and after a moment he spoke. No, Mr. Sylvia, UCLA is for Brett. As you know, it's my alma mater. This year's been a stressful time for him is all. He said, then smiled. Call it cold feet, you know? All the attention, newspapers, and now you. He's just nervous. Mr. Sylvia sat back relieved, and he looked at me. Hey, no problem. I've seen it before, and it happens, Brett, but there's nothing to be nervous about. Have you seen the campus? It's great. Sunshine all year round. Southern California at its finest. The fantastic football team with a tradition and history you'll all be a part of. And I stood. Mr. Sylvia... I really appreciate the offer, but I quit the team. I'm done playing football. My dad frowned in his expression, surprised. Almost like he hadn't listened to a goddamn word I'd said for the last two days. Now, come on now, Brad. It's just been rough this year. I'm sure we can... Rage exploded through me, and I stared at my dad sitting there like some broken hero pleading for another chance at something he'd never get. Dad, will you fucking listen to me? For once in my life, listen I yelled, feeling hot tears coming to my eyes. I quit. I'm done. I don't want to play. His mouth hung open. Mr. Sylvia stood. Brett, step outside for a moment. I promise I won't try to convince you of anything. Just a minute of your time. I wiped my eyes on my sleeve, embarrassed and ashamed and sick all at the same time. Sure. Outside, Mr. Sylvia took a card from his back pocket and looked at me. This is none of my business, Brett. My job is to find great football players, that's all. If you're not that guy, that's fine. Take this card. Call me if you change your mind, and we might be able to sort things out, huh? I looked at his outstretched hand and realized he was a good guy. Not a salesman, not a shark. I took the card. I'm sorry about that. Things just... Don't apologize, Brett. Just think about what you want. I watched him drive his rental car away and then went back inside. Dad sat on the couch, his elbows on his knees, head in his hands, and I shut the door. He grunted, looking at the floor between his feet. You happy, son? No. How could you do this? Coach told me to choose a path to walk. I chose. You didn't listen. Nobody does. He took a breath. Immense silence pounded the room in time with the beating of my heart in my ears. I'd done it. I'd taken my first steps down that road stood there looking at him. I didn't know what to feel. I loved him. He was my dad. I remembered the first football he'd ever bought me. Cheap rubber Walmart ball that I slept with because he told me I was good at catching it. I was good at something, and the only thing that mattered was that he'd said so. All the times when I was little that we played catch in the street. All the years when it was fun, just him and me. Nobody else. Then it turned into something different. Endless criticism, endless pressure, some sort of future that I had no idea about, and I blinked. Remember when we used to play, just us, out in the yard? Why can't we still be that way? Because you're not a little boy anymore. You're a young man with a future you don't realize, son, and it's my job to guide you to it. When was the last time you told me I did a good job? He clenched his teeth. Brett, for God's sake, aren't we past that? This is serious. I've got to go. I said, and I left. Chapter 10. Sunday Preston met me in the parking lot. He brought a massive black eye with him, still swollen, and it looked like a split-open plum with a blood center red. I shut the car door. Oh, I said, looking at him. What happened to you? I was doing recon when I was set upon by several criminals. And I smiled. Back to the drug smugglers, huh? Sure. I couldn't stop looking at him. You all right? He gestured to the building. Want to come up? We can study in my room. Sure. Lead the way. Want to see a marvel of modern society's ability to waste money? Sure, why not? He went to the car. Get in and I'll show you. 
I got in and fired up the engine, and he directed me through the parking lot to the garage door, and he handed me a card and told me to swipe it. Key in 1234. I pushed the buttons and handed it back the card. That's our original. My mom needs something simple. Another mystery of Preston. I drew a blank when I tried to picture his mom, and as the door opened, it revealed what looked like a parking bay, but there was no exit. Preston picked up a Ziploc bag with a crust of stale bread in it. Turn the engine off. There are carbon monoxide sensors. And I did. In another moment, the door closed behind us. Lights came on, bathing the small space in fluorescent light. Then we moved and I jumped. Whoa, what's this? It's a car elevator. We're, we're going up? I said, looking around. Yeah, to my floor. Dude, you seriously have a personal car elevator? Yes. It takes us up. Then it revolves, turning the car around for when you're ready to leave. Everybody has one, I asked, feeling us moving upward. No, just the two top floors. The peasants below us have a regular parking garage. A minute later, we arrived, and the car spun a 180, then slid to the right next to the gleaming BMW. Off to my left was a short hallway with a door at the end, and I laughed. This is so cool. He got out. All my friends are impressed. Come on. I looked at the car. That's your mom's? Yeah, she's out with her new friends. I followed him to the door, and he took me inside. We landed in the kitchen first, which was half as big as my whole house. Granite counters, a massive stainless steel refrigerator, two ovens, a huge island with sink bar stools, shining pots and pans with copper bottoms hanging from the ceiling. I felt like I was on one of those shows where they to her family, famous people's homes. Preston waved as he walked. This is the kitchen. We never use it. He kept going, leading me to the living room. Floor to ceiling windows looked out over the city, with the river rushing by 19 floors below. Leather sofas, chairs, tables, paintings, and lamps filled the room. All high end. Living room, he said. I looked at the paintings, and when I was little, I loved art class. I'd even stopped by a gallery downtown a few times just to stare at all the different works. I recognized one of them now, a Monet. It was of a woman standing on a hillside of flowers, a parasol on her shoulder, and it looked like she was waiting for someone. And I'd always wondered who. Your mom into art? No. Our old house had a Thomas Kincaid print over the mantel. She thought it'd be pretty because there were hidden animals in it. I stepped to the window. Awesome view. He stood next to me. Yeah, that's the best part. Sometimes at night I just stand and look out over the lights. So I like staring at fish. Fish? He nodded. Clinically proven to reduce stress. You should try it. I don't have fish. He led the way through the dining room and then down a hall. Neither do I. Most doctor's offices do, though. Sick people are stressed. Yeah, maybe I should go and hang out. We stopped at the door and he pointed to three more doors down the hall. Guest room, master bedroom, study. This is my room. And he opened the door. I was greeted by a bedroom bigger than our living room. I'd expected more of the same fine furnishings, but I was surprised. The room was almost entirely empty. A bed with no frame, a nightstand with a clock and a lamp on it, an old desk in front of the massive windows, chair included. On top of the desk was a computer, and next to the computer was a small CD player. Next to the keyboard was a smartphone with a pair of headphones plugged into it. Next to the desk was a mini refrigerator. I turned a circle, taking in the only piece of furniture, a dresser. Four posters clung to the walls behind his bed, which faced the bank of windows looking over the city. All comic book posters. The Hulk, Captain America, Spider-Man, and Batman. You like comics? I collect them. Cool, I used to read Superman. He pointed to a door next to the closet. Bathroom's in there if you need to go. Thanks, I said, studying his room. The posters were hung perfectly level, spaced evenly apart. His comics were in a neat pile on the shelf, and his bed was made. Not a crease on it. The smartphone was placed in line with the keyboard, and the keyboard was centered perfectly in front of the computer. The headphones were rolled into a perfect circle. Not a wire or connection to be seen under the desk, unlike mine, which was a jungle of black vines. Preston walked over to the door. I'll be back with an extra chair. There's stuff in the fridge if you want. And then he was gone. 
I felt like it was in a normal Earth room, but in a different dimension of almost neurotic Leave it to Beaver organization. I could imagine June Cleaver flitting around the room with a duster in her hand. Everything was so neat. I felt like I shouldn't touch anything. I opened the fridge. Water, Mountain Dew, grape soda, Pepsi, and Sprite all lined up perfectly. And then I noticed grape first, Mountain Dew second, then Pepsi, Sprite, and water all alphabetically organized. I took a Mountain Dew and then walked to the bathroom. Opening it, I laughed. It wasn't a bathroom. It was a bathroom's bathroom. A walk-in shower with three heads next to that jetted tub. Two sinks. The only normal thing was the toilet. Feeling sneaky, I looked back into the room and then crept to the medicine cabinet, opening it. Yep, everything perfectly placed, but this time in order of use. Did you need something out there? And I jumped, turning. Sorry, I, I had to. He looked at me. Head to what? Your room. It's, it's like perfect. Everything. I had to see the bathroom. I like things orderly. Yeah, I feel like I shouldn't be here. He shrugged. You probably shouldn't be looking through my personal items, but no, I invited you here. So why don't we start? He sat at the desk and I joined him while he booted up his computer and I took a swig of soda. You mind if I ask a question? Go ahead. You have the coolest place I've ever seen, but then we get to your room and it looks like mine, but just neat. Why? Does your mom not buy you good stuff? He fiddled with the mouse. I like my old things. You weren't always rich? No. How'd you get all the money? My dad had a life insurance policy. Actually, he had four. Mom didn't know about them. They equaled over two and a half million dollars. Whoa. He stared at the screen. So, what are you studying in math? How'd you really get the black eye? And he logged on to the internet. I had a confrontation last night. What happened? I was punched in the eye. How'd the game go? I wasn't there. The corner of his lip turned up in what could have been a smile. I know. I was being facetious. I didn't bother with not knowing what facetious meant, because he was the only person I knew who could know what it meant. This whole thing sucks, you know? Yeah, life sucks for everybody sometimes. What are you studying, Brett? Algebra. Okay, let's start.